A very good evening to all our participants tonight. Thank you very much for making the time to invest in yourself and learning more about global stock markets with us. I am Ping Mei, your host for tonight and also the founder of Prosperous. We are very lucky tonight to have two amazing speakers, Tim and Sudan, investment experts who are going to give us a one-on-one -on -one introduction to the US, Hong Kong and Singapore stock markets. As most of us know, market diversification is important when building an investment portfolio. And that is why we have chosen these three markets to cover tonight. Before we begin, as the founder of Prosperous, let me share with you who we are. Prosperous is a new digital investment service by CGS CIMB, the number one broker on SGX. We are a team of passionate millennial investors who have been given this opportunity to bring you a multi-asset, multi-market investment offering to help you prosper with us. Now you know how we came up with the name. Our platform offers eight types of products and covers over 30 exchanges globally. Our purpose statement is driving individuals and communities to make better investment decisions for a sustainable future. And this leads to our commitment to bring investor education to the forefront of Prosperous and everything that we do. We are not here to encourage you to trade more, but we are here to educate and share investment knowledge and insights with you to empower you to make better decisions for yourself. As millennials and also Gen Zs, we are addicted to social media. So please follow Prosperous on Facebook. This is for the older millennials, as I've been told by my younger colleagues that Facebook is no longer cool for them. Since I still use Facebook, I think you can figure out my age. For those of you who are not in my age group, you can also follow us on Instagram and LinkedIn. And please scan the QR code to access our website. Just a quick introduction about myself. Most people have asked me why I am called the founder of Prosperous when we are not a startup. Well, it's because I was the first team member when we initiated this new digital business for CGS CIMB. I started with Prosperous back in 2019. And now that we are a live business with a solid team in place, I get to call myself the founder and let the awesome team do all the work. My other full-time job is as the group head of strategy analytics for CGS CIMB, a role that I've had for the past three years and one that I am very grateful for because it allows me to help shape the company's strategy and direction. Prosperous is part of what we call the millennial strategy for CGS CMB, and it brings the experience of CGS CMB, a top Singapore broker with over 40 years of heritage and history, into the new era of digital investing for the new generation of investors. Now, let me introduce the two speakers that we have tonight. Tim Phillips is the content composer for Prosperous, but we call him our long-term investing guru. He has over 10 years of experience in financial markets, as in an avid investor himself. Tim can talk about stocks for hours. His passion for investing is an asset, and he is excited to play a part in grooming the next generation of investors. I myself have personally learned so much from Tim in the past few months that we have worked together. Sudan, meanwhile, is the content strategies and investment lead for Sidley. Sidley is Singapore's biggest personal finance community, and they cover everything and anything to do with finance, from credit cards to insurance to loans and obviously investments. I am personally a big fan of Sydney, and I'm sure a lot of you know about them. Now, Sudan is not just an investing guru. He's also an accomplished author of a Singapore team stock market investment book called Investla, The Average Joe's Guide to Investing. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get started, and I'll hand it over to Tim and Sudan. Hi, thanks, Ping. Thanks for that um, intro. Um, yeah, so as, as Ping may have said, um, I'm going to kind of walk through, um, you know, why we should be global in our approach to stock markets, because I think that's really important, that diversification aspect. Um, and I think I'll give you a bit of background with me and Sudan. We used to work together at The Motley Fool. Um, we we're colleagues there. So, you know, we both have a real passion for long term investing, for educating investors on how to responsibly invest uh, for the long term. So I'm hoping with today's um, sort of talk, you know, we can kind of get people a bit more excited about investing over the long term and, and kind of thinking more globally about how you can access those opportunities. Um, so let me start um, with my presentation here first. Oops. Yeah. Okay, so we're about getting woke uh, on, you know, it's in the age of wokeness that we're in right now. So I think we should kind of learn a bit more about stock market as well and kind of figuring out where we can tap those opportunities so before i start let me kind of just go through the obligatory um, you know disclaimers from compliance this is 
my own personal opinion. This is not meant to be construed as personalized financial advice. Uh, so please, please don't take it as that. Um, and let's get started. So let's kind of go through what are the major stock markets first. I think for everyone who's obviously signed up, you realize we're going to talk about Hong Kong, we're going to talk about US, and we talk, we're going to talk about Singapore. Um, so here, you know, we've got Hong Kong, China, we've got the US in, in red there is actually the total market cap of that particular market. So what that means is that that $45 trillion is actually the value of all US listed shares. So if you took the, the dollar value of all the shares and added it together, it would equal 45 trillion. And, and in Hong Kong, you've got the dollar value of all shares equaling 7.2 trillion. So these, these are two big markets, but as you can see, the US is kind of out there on its own in terms of, in terms of its size. And then obviously you've got the local Singapore market, which is a bit smaller. There are definitely opportunities in there, but as you can see, the you know the total market cap of the uh, Singapore stock market is about uh, 550 billion dollars. Okay, so let's dig into the U.S. I think the U.S. is obviously the one that a lot of people are interested in, just because it is the biggest stock market in the world, and also it has some of the biggest companies in the world as well. I mean, here you've got five tech giants, uh, you know, without their names there, but everyone can kind of recognize that instantly what what company that is and you know the kinds of services that they provide so over the past sort of decade these types of companies have really really come to the fore and have now dominate uh, the stock market in the us so you know you've got amazon apple google microsoft um, and facebook and those are actually the top five companies in the us market in terms of the market cap so they're the largest uh, and four of those are actually worth over a trillion dollars so facebook is the only one out of those five that is actually worth less than one trillion dollars so it kind of gives you and you know it kind of tells you about the scale of that of these types of companies so all four of them you know are on their own bigger than the singapore stock market so that kind of tells you the size of these these types of companies in the us Okay, so we kind of look at the S&P 500. So I, I think the last the the last webinar that I did, I did talk about the you know index investing, and obviously the S&P 500 is the market index. It is the, the key stock market index in the U.S. Um, so if you're looking to invest either in ETFs or in stocks, a lot of you know a lot of these reputable stocks end up being in the index. And so this is a index that's run by Standard and Poor's. Um, obviously covers 500 of the largest companies in the US. Uh, and you, you can think about the scale in terms of how much is actually linked to the S&P 500. So you've got over about $11 trillion worth of assets. They're actually tied to the S&P 500 that either track it through an ETF or you know, use it as a benchmark to, to match performance. Um, and obviously it still has a technology tilt to it. So there's all those technology companies plus more that are in there. But those five technology companies make up around sort of 17 to 20 percent of the S&P 500. So you have to realize when you do buy that index that you have a really big technology exposure. And that's just a feature of the stock market as it is today, just because technology is so, so big. OK, and this this slide, I think I just kind of wanted to talk about how uh, how how they've come to, to, to you know, really rise up and be at this stage in their existence, just because you know, about 10 years ago, I don't think many of these companies were in the top 10. So now you're kind of seeing Facebook, Alphabet, and those other three in the top, in the top five. And Tesla actually went into the top five probably a few months ago, but it's dropped out, but it's still there and it's, it's had a huge run. And you know, nowadays we kind of think of Tesla as not really a car company, but more as a tech company. So it's kind of indicative of that trend of, tech really starting to dominate. And, and these are the 10 largest companies in the US, right? And you can kind of see that technology does dominate. And the older school ones like Johnson & Johnson and maybe JP Morgan, the banks, you know, they've kind of come down a little bit in terms of their importance and their size as well. And long-term investing. I mean, I like to hop, hop on about this, but it really does work. So this is actually a chart looking at the top returns in terms of the S&P 500 constituent stocks over the last 10 years. So, you know, that K there represents thousands. So in terms of Tesla, that's a percentage return. So Tesla has been really, really, really far out in terms of the returns it's, it's had over the past 10 years. I mean, 14,200, you know, uh, percent, that's insane. Uh, but it, they're, 
there is there there are times when those types of stocks do fall maybe 30 or 40 percent and that's just typical because that's what happens with technology stocks they aren't that volatile and that's happened numerous times with some of these massive companies like netflix and amazon they've have fallen 30 40 percent but they always end up kind of recovering or these these types of companies that do have successful business models do always end up recovering and and making a comeback as well Thank you very much, Tim, for the overview of the U.S. market. Now, you mentioned quite a little bit about uh, technology stocks doing very well in the last 10 years. So, you know, if you look back 12 years ago, before the 2008 global financial crisis, the world's biggest market cap companies were largely non-tech, such as Exxon, Chevron, Procter & Gamble. And obviously today, as you've shown, tech companies are clearly dominating. Why has this shift happened? Well, I think it's it's as simple as these types of technological products are now so common in our lives. Um, so, you know, the iPhone, where was that 20 years ago? It didn't even exist. Um, and now Apple gets half over half its revenue from, from that product, right? From the iPhone. So I think it's just a, a function of how society has evolved, how society has changed, um, how businesses have changed and how, how many people and businesses rely on these technology giants now, right? And they're actually creating a lot of value and cash flow and um, at, and services that people use every day, right? So I think that's the difference from say maybe 20 years ago with the bubble, with the tech bubble where people were just IPOing on crazy ideas and there was no revenue. Uh, these tech giants have been around for at least, you know, it may be in, in Microsoft's case, like 30, over 30 years now. Um, so they're actually making a lot of money. Uh, even some of the newest social media players like Facebook and Google, they're, they're generating a lot of cash flow as well. So I think it's just a trend. It's just a mega trend, which, which I like to talk about is mega trends and riding on those and making sure that you're invested in those types of companies, as opposed to being on the wrong side of a mega trend, which is what you would say with a lot of these oil and gas giants, you know, they've been on the wrong side of that change in the world. Um, so I think that's the main, I'd say that's the main reason for why they've, uh, they've kind of risen up to, to, to be so big now. So on this note uh, of tech stocks, could you tell us which is your favorite US tech stock and why? Um, I think my favorite is one of the giants. Um, and I do have other favorites, but they're maybe less proven. But in terms of the bedrock stock, I think this is a really good one that anyone can kind of buy to start a portfolio would be Microsoft. I think it's just one of those really reliable, you know, high cash flow generating companies. It has a lot of different business lines, which say one, if one isn't performing as well as the other, the other can maybe pick up the slack. So, you know, they obviously have Office, Microsoft Office 365, which is a subscription productivity tool service. Then they also have gaming. So they're in the Xbox and now they've started subscription cloud gaming. And then finally they have cloud computing, right? So they're just behind AWS, but they're, they're way ahead of Google in terms of, in terms of cloud uh, capacity and cloud capabilities. Um, and you know, the, the CEO Satya Nadella has done a really, really great job uh, in terms of growing that cloud business alongside the other two businesses. And so I think, you know, there's massive, massive uh, runway for Microsoft to keep growing with cloud as well as the other two businesses. And I, I think it's one of those stocks that you can uh, you can invest in and, and sleep easy at night. You know, 30 years and counting, I, I feel like I've grown up, you know, with Microsoft and it's still so relevant today. Uh, what about you, Sudan? Which is your favorite US tech stock? I've got uh, actually a few tech stocks. Uh, actually, all that Tim mentioned uh, are, are also what I like. But um, the favorite of them all among the tech stocks is uh, this company called DocuSign. So DocuSign is involved uh, in providing e-signature solutions. So um, the company has grown a lot over the past few years, um, especially during the COVID pandemic, um, when people couldn't meet um, to sign documents and you know, there were lockdowns all over the world. So DocuSign really, uh, really, DocuSign's business really benefited from, from, that, um, from that aspect. But I think over the long term, uh, DocuSign should continue doing well. Um, so all those customers who have uh, signed up with DocuSign um, I don't think they will leave DocuSign after the pandemic is over because they, have, they can see the benefits of uh, e-signing. They don't have to meet people and they can get documents signed immediately, almost instantaneously. So I think um, over the long term, as more people um, go, go digital um, and, and more people um, 
want to do things fast, I think DocuSign will, will be relevant in many, many years to come. Yeah. Thank you very much, Sudan. And now back to you, Tim. Yeah. So uh, where, where I left off was basically Hong Kong. So I think now that we've kind of covered the US briefly, we can take a look at, we can take a look at Hong Kong. So I think, obvious, I think obviously a lot of people know that Hong Kong is part of China and it's really the gateway to China. So it, is, it gives investors access to the Chinese market that you wouldn't be able to, to get because actually investing into the mainland Chinese stock market is really, really difficult. You have to do it through Hong Kong and then you have to buy A shares, which are listed in China. Um, so it's only recently been available Chinese mainland listed stocks, but they're hard to buy. So, so Hong Kong is really the default way for investors who are outside China to buy, to buy the uh, China-based stocks. And so the Hang Seng Index, which I had, had, had covered, I think, previously as well, that this is a really large index that is based on uh, you know, 30 or 32, 32, I think, of the largest companies in, in Hong Kong. But it's not actually that representative. Um, so if you look here at the 10 largest in Hong Kong by market cap, you've got the three tech giants at the top, Tencent, Alibaba, Meituan, uh, Meituan Dianping. And then you have some, you know, you have some banks like CCB, which is China Construction Bank, and AIA, which is an insurer, and then China Mobile and, and HSBC. So, there's a bit more of the of the tech heavy at the top, and then there's some middling sort of financials and telcos in the middle, uh, and then you also have Xiaomi, which is also a, a tech giant, um, you know, rounding out the top ten. But as you can see, the top three, and they're quite, you know, away ahead of everyone else, is Tencent, Alibaba, and Meituan. But it doesn't actually get reflected in the weighting of the Hang Seng Index. So the Hang Seng Index, as you can see on the right hand side, is actually mostly weighted towards financials. So you're thinking of banks, insurance stocks, Chinese banks, um, th those types of names. And actually recently the Hang Seng Index's company, which runs the Hang Seng Index, they have revamped or they're planning to revamp the Hang Seng Index. So if you kind of take a look at the QR code there, or, or you know, I've written an article on the actual revamp recently and what investors should know about it. But essentially it does give more influence to technology stocks, which I think is long overdue. I think that's something that we had all known about. Uh, you know, Hong Kong is a base for China, Chinese technology stocks to list. Uh, and that's been happening at an increasing clip recently, as you can see. And I think in the first four, the top four IPOs this year have actually, by dollar value, have actually been in Hong Kong uh, and they've been of China, Chinese related technology stocks. So that's global in, the top, in terms of top four. So the amounts of money that are being raised in Hong Kong are not, are not insignificant there, you know, they are big. On the left-hand side, I just wanted to touch on the different types of companies because I think people should be aware of Hong Kong stocks and their makeup, their different makeup. So Hong Kong Ordinary is just a Hong Kong domiciled, Hong Kong listed stock, uh, quite plain vanilla, like nothing really too, too unusual about that. Um, Hate Share is a, dual listed stock. So they'll have A shares in Hong Kong, but they'll have their H share listed in, uh, sorry, A share listed in mainland China and their H share represents their Hong Kong listed stock. So these are Chinese mainland stocks that also have a Hong Kong listing. And so that's H shares. So you saw a lot of the big Chinese banks in, uh, in the sort of 2000s go public in Hong Kong, but they also had a listing in Shanghai and Shenzhen as well. Uh, and then other Hong Kong, listed mainland companies, these are actually a, what a lot of a lot of the technology giants use to list. So you're thinking Alibaba and Tencent, uh, and I think Meituan as well, actually, they use a what is called a variable interest, uh, variable interest uh, entity, which is a VIE. Uh, it's a legal entity which places, you know, the actual assets in in a different jurisdiction, but the shareholders have the rights to it. So it's just a different type of corporate structure that is used by a lot of tech, tech companies to list. And then finally, you have red chips, which are small. It's a small portion of it, but red chips represent companies that have a Chinese government influence behind it. So it's actually, it was actually named from uh, an economist in, in Hong Kong who just decided to, the, the association with the Chinese Communist Party, you should, call, you should call them red chips. So for example, China Mobile, uh, is only listed in Hong Kong. It's not listed in China, but it actually does, uh, it's actually majority owned by the Chinese government. So 
the red chips are incorporated outside of China, um, but they are Chinese. So for example, Lenovo would be another red chip and SMIC, which is a big semiconductor um, company is, is also a red chip company. Okay, so moving on. What's the lesson? I mean, for me, the lesson is to be wary of indices. You don't want to buy a lot of the rubbish, which I personally think there's a lot of rubbish in the Hang Seng Index right now. So you actually have a lot of uh, really just terrible state-owned enterprise stocks, such as banks and, and oil and gas companies, which have been great at destroying shareholder value over the long term. So that's the exact opposite of what you want to do when you invest, right? You invest because you want to grow your wealth and grow your money. So not automatically just putting it in an index and thinking it's fine. I think that's a lesson that we, we need to be wary of when we do invest in Hong Kong. It's like there are really, really great companies there, but you have to go out and find them and you have to go out and buy them. Or, you know, alternatively, you could get into the Hang Seng Tech Index. So this is actually a, a new index that was created last year in, in July by the Hang Seng Index's company. And I think this was obviously from overwhelming demand for an index that tracked these technology giants and these tech companies that have such influence in the new China. And so now what you've got is a collection of about 30 of the top tech, tech companies that are listed in Hong Kong, Chinese tech companies. And, you know, they did a bit of back backdating in terms of performance. What if this index had been around five years ago or three years ago? And you can, you can see there the, the amount of outperformance and how much it basically destroyed the Hang Seng Index in terms of returns. Uh, so on a five-year basis, it would have returned five times what you would have you know, got putting it into a, into a Hang Seng Index tracker fund. So thinking about these types of companies and where you can find them and where the opportunities are is, is interesting. But there are also other opportunities in other sectors, such as insurance and healthcare, which I think are maybe not appreciated as much. But there is definitely a lot of innovation and a lot of, a lot of um, you know, a lot of a lot of tech companies that are really doing new things in China. And it's a different type of era to maybe 10 years ago in China, where everyone would just say, oh, they're just copying the US. I mean, these guys now that are coming out of China, their type of innovation is is really fresh and really new. And they're doing a lot of really exciting things. So there, there are opportunities there for sure. And so ETFs are tracking it. This is a, just a basic uh, sort of representation of it. I think the expense ratio is something you always want to be mindful of, but I also kind of want to look at the daily volume as well. So daily volume, you want the amount of shares that are being traded to be to be higher to give you a bit more volume in terms of your in terms of buying the, the shares as well. Uh, what that allows you to do, it allows you to have a narrower bid spread, which is when you bid basically a bid ask rather a bid is um, buying and then the ask is the selling. So what you want to try and do is you want to narrow that so that there isn't a massive difference. Um, so this is this is just a general a general uh, slide to show that I personally don't have uh, I don't personally don't invest in Hang Seng Tech, but I I know that iShares is you know obviously a popular one. BlackRock have, have released it recently, and then CSOP is the biggest as you can see in terms of AUM. Um, so there are lots of different options. And also, if you want to buy it in Singapore dollars, you can because they have a OCBC Securities Hang Seng Tech EDF that is listed in Singapore. Uh, so that is also an option as well. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, now, I know you're a big fan of the Hong Kong markets, having grown up in Hong Kong yourself. Now, Hong Kong is one of the leading stock exchanges in Asia, and its ease of entry provides investors with exposure to China's growing economy. Personally, I have always wanted to invest into Hong Kong and China markets, but I've always lacked the confidence to do so. There's just so many companies that I'm not familiar with, unlike Singapore, where obviously it's home ground. So what advice do you have for someone like me when you know, venturing into a new market for the first time? I think in, in Hong Kong's case, yeah, I think a lot of people have this misperception of China as, you know, there, there has been the S-chip scandal here maybe 10, 10 years ago. But I think that that is, if you put your money into penny stocks, that happens everywhere, right? That happens in, in Hong Kong, that happens in the US, that happens in Europe, that happens in every market. Um, so what I would say is just, just focus on really, really great companies, really solid companies, um, some of the bigger companies avoid these state-owned enterprises, avoid these state-owned banks, like anything where the state has too big of a hand, 
in the business is going to be detrimental to your returns because shareholders will not be given priority in terms of the business, right? Usually it's a strategic priority for the state. So they will use the business uh, to kind of see to that in terms of in terms of meeting meeting strategic goals. Having said that, there are so many other businesses listed there that have these massive addressable total addressable markets that you can that you can buy into. Um, so I think I would say stick with you know stick with really reputable strong companies with strong fundamentals, or you know go into an ETF like I like I just outlined. I think an ETF and a tech ETF gives you that broad exposure to a basket of tech stocks in in Hong Kong, which I think is 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 a great way to start as a launching pad. And then once you're a bit more comfortable with the market, maybe you can then move on to other sectors and, and look at individual stocks as well. And on that note, uh, what is your favorite Hong Kong stock? Well, if you remember slide, the first slide, I, I slide, I'd gone over AIA. I mean, it is, it's easy to say Tencent or Alibaba just because they're so big and they are great companies and well, very well run companies and, and technology, which is really exciting. But for me, AIA just takes the cake. It's just a really, really great, great company. Uh, it's very solidly run. It's an insurer, which is, gives you exposure across Asia. So in terms of its value of new business, which is another name for, I guess, revenue for insurance companies, uh, you know, about 50 to 60% came from Hong Kong and China. So you're looking at another 40% from Asia. And we all know in Singapore, we're familiar with AIA. Uh, its other key markets are Thailand and Malaysia. Um, you know, they have a joint venture in, in Indonesia. They have a joint venture in India. Uh, they're also in South Korea. Uh, but what really excites me is this opportunity for them to expand into China, right? So they are actually only in about seven or eight regions now in China. And there are plans for them to expand up to maybe another 10 or 12 regions over the next decade. And their market share in China is absolutely tiny. I think it's about 1% or 1% to 2%. So the runway for them to keep growing and keep executing is, you know, is there. And they've They've had that track record over the past 10 years since they listed. They have that track record of excellence, that track record of, of really good execution, um, of really good capital management. And you can see that in the share returns over the past decade, right? It's not been something that's gone up 200 or 300 percent in a year, like we saw with a lot of tech stocks last year. But in terms of it's slow and steady and it continues to, to keep growing, it's probably returned about 400 to 500 percent over the past 10 years, which is an amazing, you know, an amazing return if you think about it. Thank you very much. And uh, what about you, Sudan? Do you have a top Hong Kong stock pick? Um, I don't really follow the Hong Kong market as closely as Tim uh, does, but um, I own some units in the Hang Seng Tech uh, ETF. Those that one, the one listed in Singapore, the Lion OCBC one. Yeah. That, that's definitely a, a good ETF to gain exposure. It's yeah, that's right. Market. So, yeah. So instead of picking individual stocks, I thought, uh, why not go with the ETF? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great that's a great start, especially in like in the in market as big as Hong Kong. Like a, a Hang Seng Tech ETF is definitely um, yeah, you get exposure to the right area, I think, with, with that ETF. So you kind of don't have to actively watch it at all. Yeah, you don't have to worry so much about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I'm just gonna quickly launch a poll now that we've you know heard quite a little bit about the uh, Hong Kong market. So how likely are you guys, you know, to invest in the Hong Kong market now? Okay, so while the uh, poll is going on, I'll pass it back to you, Tim. For the, oh, sorry, to Sudan to talk about the uh, Singapore markets. Yeah. Okay, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Tim for inviting me uh, to give a, a speech on um, the Singapore stock market. So, um, yeah, so let's go on to the next slide. Yeah, so the Straits Times Index um, is basically Singapore's uh, benchmark index. So in the US, you have the S&P 500 index, as Tim mentioned, um, and in Hong Kong, you have the Hang Seng index. So in Singapore, it's the STI index. And similar to Hong Kong market, um, the banks make up majority of the index. So if you can see the top three banks, DBS, OCBC, and UOB, um, they make up around 40% of the index. Um, and also you have the um, well-known companies such as Singtel, Capital Land and Singapore Exchange, making up the top 10 constituents of the Straits Times Index. And uh, following the Straits Times Index, there's this uh, reserve list, which makes up um, 
five company, five REITs. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the SDI reserve list. So what this list does is um, whenever any company from the SDI becomes in ineligible to still be listed, and one of the companies from here will, will replace that component. So the SDI reserve list, you can think about it as a substitute bench uh, in a football team. The, the first company with the biggest market cap um, probably is uh, Fraser's Logistics and Commercial Trust currently. Uh, if any of the co components in the Straits Times Index uh, is not going to be part of the index going forward, this first company will replace it and, and so on. So um, if I'm not wrong, the Straits Times Index is reviewed quarterly, every quarter. So if there are changes, the changes will take place every quarter. And you can see from this slide, uh, it's mostly wheat heavy. So um, the first four are all REITs. The last one is a business trust. So um, yeah, so you can see from this composition also that the Singapore market is, is, is famous for REITs. As you can see from this slide, uh, Singapore is one of the largest REIT and property trust market with uh, 43 REITs in all in, in Singapore. The first REIT was listed in uh, Singapore in, in 2002, which was Capital Land Mall Trust currently known as uh, Capital Land Integrated Commercial Trust. But since then, our Singapore REIT market has grown very, very significantly, as you can see from this chart. Um, at a glance, the average dividend yield is around 6%. So income investors would like um, this high dividend yield. And over the 10, past 10 years, if you can see on the left side, uh, the bottom left, uh, total annualized return is around uh, 9%, so not too shabby as well. On the right side, uh, we can see um, the diversification of, of all the REITs listed in Singapore. So you have industrial REITs, hospitality REITs, like um, the hotels, diversified REITs, retail REITs, like um, Fraser's Centerpoint Trust and also Fraser's Integrated Commercial Trust, it's, uh, which also combines the office aspect as well. And we also have a Apple DC REIT, which is a specialized REIT investing in data centers. And just below the pie chart, you can see the, um, the spread of the exposure the REITs have uh, geographically. So not only in Singapore, you have uh, trusts that have assets in Hong Kong, South Korea, Japan, China, and so on. So next slide, please. Yep, so um, just like how, if you don't want to pick individual REITs, uh, you can go with ETFs. So Tim talked about um, Hang Seng Tech ETF uh, earlier. So this is the REIT uh, ETFs listed in Singapore. So we have three ETFs, uh, REIT ETFs in Singapore. So uh, you can see from this chart, the first one is the Lion Philip S3 ETF, which uh, mainly focuses on Singapore REITs. And the middle one is the Nikko AM one, which uh, has a majority focus in Singapore, followed by Hong Kong and so on. The last one is the Philip SJX APEC Dividend Leaders REIT, ETF, which uh, has a bigger focus in Australia. So uh, depending on which geography you want to get exposure to, you can choose uh, which ETF you want to uh, buy into. And if you look further down the chart, you can see the total expense ratio. So this actually shows the total cost an investor would have to fork out to buy um, any of the REIT. So the first two REITs have an expense ratio of around 0.6%. Uh, and the last one is an expense ratio of a bit uh, on the high Higher, higher than 0 0.6, which is at 0.9%. Um, the last two weeks, you also can choose whether you want to invest in Singapore dollars or US dollars. And the code, the stock code will differ accordingly as well. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sudan. Now, you know, the Singapore market has had a very challenging 2020 relative to other global markets. So what makes it still a good market to invest in? Yeah, you're right, Pingmei. Like last year, I think the Singapore stock market was the uh, was Asia's worst performing benchmark uh, index. So I think it fell like around 12% or so. Uh, but but this year, um, the Straits Times Index has recovered. And I think it's one of the better performing ones um, in, in this part of the region. So I think uh, what has contributed to this is um, value, people going for value. So Singapore, uh, you know, the banks make up most of the index and um, the banks have been beaten down because of the pandemic. But going forward, I think people are seeing value as, as the economies pick up, as vaccinations roll out and economies open up, borders open up. I think um, they're seeing value in Singapore stocks, especially the banks. 
And I think, um, as mentioned earlier, like the REITs, uh, the people who are looking for dividends, Singapore is no, well known for, for dividend counters, dividend companies. So those looking for dividends uh, have also been flocking to, I think, the three times index or the Singapore market in general. Yeah, so I think over the long term, uh, I don't think Singapore market will perform too shabby, shabbily. Like uh, it will still give average returns, in my opinion. So those who are looking for value, who want, uh, who are, who are afraid of uh, high valuation in the US and stuff like that, they can look into Singapore stocks. And especially if you're a dividend investor, Singapore stocks, I think, uh, they they they're good. They give good income. Well, value stocks aside, you know, with the ongoing vaccine rollout and expected economy recovery this year, with Singapore obviously, you know, uh, being at the forefront of the vaccination drive, you know, silicon stocks are also expected to rebound. Which are your top picks? Yep. So I think, uh, I think the banks, uh, as I mentioned earlier, will, will do well. So if if uh, investors recall last year, uh, the MAS uh, basically what they said is the banks have to cap their 2019 dividend the 2020 dividends to 2019's uh, 60 percent of 2019's dividends so what it, it means is that the banks can't pay the full dividend amount but they only can pay 60 percent of 2019's dividend so uh but the banks can actually afford to pay more um, some of the banks like ocbc has said that uh, they can actually afford to pay more so going forward if mes uh, gets rid of the cap i think uh, uh and, and income investors want some income i think they can look into the banks but my, my favorite company uh, of them all in, in the Singapore market is uh, SETS, which is involved in um, the aviation and non-aviation sector. So SETS, uh, if, you, if, if you travel to Changi Airport, as soon as you go overseas, obviously you can't travel now. But uh, previously, uh, when, you, when you travel overseas, uh, the ground handlers usually is done by SETS. And uh, when you check in and you know, when, you, when, you, when you get the tickets at the front desk, it's usually meant by SETS staff. So um, SETS, I think, is one beneficiary of, of the economy opening up, travel opening up, and, and so on. Um, not only does SETS have, have uh, has its arms in aviation, it is also involved in the non-aviation aviation sector, like food distribution. Um, even even um, some of the NS guys would know that SETS is involved in you know, our cookhouse. They provide all the food in, in a lot of cookhouses in, in Singapore. So, so I think holistically, SETS, can continue doing well uh, over the long term. Yeah. Thank you, Sudan. And what about you, Tim? Um, yeah, I, I think I would also, I would also echo uh, Sudan's sentiment on the banks. I think you know they've got they've they've got room to rebound this year just because of the underperformance and the caps on the dividends last year. I prefer the leading bank. I think just TBS is just a better quality bank on the whole versus the other two. I know some people like to buy all three and then some people like to buy one. I'm one of those that likes that likes to focus on, on the leader. And I think DBS is, is showing itself to be, uh, you know, the, the leader in the, in the space uh, with, with great management. So I think I would say DBS. And then I think maybe another one REIT, which I really, really like is Maple Tree Industrial Trust, which is a REIT focused on, on industrial properties in Singapore, but has also got a data center angle to it. So it's, but this is something that it had been acquiring back in 2017. It started to acquire data centers I mean, way before the pandemic. So I think they've been quite prescient in terms of the longer term trend. Uh, and they're very financially disciplined. And, and the, the DPU, the, the dividend that they pay out, has been rising consistently since, since it listed. So I think it's one of those that will continue to do well um, Yeah, over the longer term. Thanks for all your uh, sharing. I definitely will have a few items to add to my watch list later tonight. Now, I'm just going to quickly share the uh, poll results. 70% of the audience says that they are likely to invest in Hong Kong market now. So well done, Tim. You've uh, convinced a lot of people. <laughs> um, that's good. That's good news. Good to hear. Um, so I think... So Dan, you wanted to kind of touch on something before. Uh, before yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Tim. It is, yeah. Yeah, so it's this Sidley's personal uh, finance festival happening on 10th April. So, um, so this year is going to be virtual. So uh, last year we couldn't do it because of COVID, but this year we are back uh, bigger. 
we are going to do it virtual and we are inviting um, the founder of Up Investments, uh, Kat Catherine DeWood. I think a lot of people would know her. Um, she's uh, the, the, the famous disruptive innovator, innovation investor. So we are inviting her and also um, famous economist, Jameis Lip. So if those who want to know about Singapore economy and how it will do over the many, many years to come, I think um, he's the one to listen. We also have many other uh, great speakers like uh, Reming from the Work Salary Man, Timothy Ho from Dollars and Cents, and, and so on. So if you want to get a ticket, uh, you can scan the QR code there. And we have a 20% discount for webinar participants today. So if you use the promo code SAVE20, S-A-V-E-2-0, uh, you can get 20% off your ticket price. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, so yeah. hoping to see you on 10th April. It's exciting. Looks like, looks, a good, looks like a good lineup. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to just round out with, with market liquidity. So market liquidity, uh, it sounds scary. It's really not. So liquidity is just a technical term for, uh, you know, how easy it is it to, uh, or how liquid is the market? Is it easy to get money in and out? And there is, a, is there a lot of, is there a lot of money in the market, right? In terms of, in terms of people buying and selling every day in the stock market. So I think I wanted to just highlight how big the US is because it is absolutely enormous. Uh, and the next slide is gonna, is gonna show you, kind of illustrate that point as well. So the US has two key indices, I would say, or ex stock exchanges where stock trading happens. So it's the New York Stock Exchange and then also the NASDAQ. And a lot of people will be familiar, the NASDAQ is, is more tech oriented uh, than the New York Stock Exchange, but actually the NASDAQ also has non-tech companies and the New York Stock Exchange also has tech companies. So um, there's a generalization, but they also have other companies listed on both. Um, on, on both exchanges. And then the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, obviously, and the, the Singapore uh, Exchange as well. And so you can kind of see the average daily volume. So what is that? That is actually the value of all shares uh, on, the, on an average basis that are traded every day in the market. So you can see in the US last year for the NASDAQ, on an average day in the US on the NASDAQ market, it was $142 billion, right? And then you're looking at the New York Stock Exchange and how big that is. Um, and then obviously Hong Kong comes in third and Singapore is, is, is a lot further behind. So I wanted just to highlight how share trading can impact the pricing. If you are trading into a really, really big stock or a larger cap stock, you'll be able to get a better price in terms of how thin that spread is, as, as, as I had mentioned earlier, bid ask. So I think the general rule of thumb is if the more liquidity, there's better pricing. So I think this is also one reason that a lot of people also trade in the US is just, it's very familiar. Maybe the access is a lot easier to get into that market. That doesn't mean that the other markets don't have easy access. It's just, I think the characteristic of the US market is it and how big it is, it is just so dominant in, in, in its influence on the global stock markets. Oops, sorry just go through. Um, okay, and then I wanted to end on a psychology of investing lesson. Uh, so this is something I'm doing in every webinar. I just want to do a quick one minute of, I think, you know, human behavioral, uh, human behavior when we invest, I think what holds us back a lot of the time is actually the psychology rather than picking a bad stock or picking the right stock or picking the right fund or ETF. It's actually making sure that you've got the, uh, the discipline and the patience to hold these types of stocks and these types of funds and these types of ETFs over the long term. Um, so loss aversion is a good one. I think this is something that a lot of people may not be aware of, but obviously the pain is of losing money is, is twice as big as the joy of winning money. So when you do lose money, it really does hurt. Um, but I would remind people that that's not any reason to stop investing or to stop you from investing because keeping your money in cash or whatever for 10, 10, 15, 20 years um, means that you're obviously going to lose a lot more money to inflation. Uh, so I think it's just, we have to accept that stock markets will fall as well as rise. I mean, last year was an exceptional year. I don't think that's something we should expect every year. Uh, it's definitely an anomaly. So um, I, I don't think, you know, I think a lot of people have started investing recently and think this is normal. This is a normal type of year. 2020 it definitely isn't. Um, but on the whole, they do rise over time. So that's something that's important to remember as well. And, it, and it's, it's important to remember that you will 
you will obviously have some some investments that will go down but then the hope the hope is that your overall portfolio you have enough diversification that those winners will will overtake uh, the losers and and you will uh, you will make a, re a good return so uh, that's the hope okay so thanks uh, we're going to move on to q a now right i think ping but before before that did you want to, uh, yeah i think we kind of want to look at the upcoming webinars we've got uh, for Prosperous. So on the seventh, uh, we've got a we've got a platform platform walkthrough with the with the product product team with uh, you know walking us through the digital platform of Prosperous and how you can how you can invest in different markets globally. Um, build, which is more of a of an application to for investors who are long term, and Boost, which is more of a short term trading application, um, and then also the functions of our of our platforms as well. And then on the 15th, I'm going to be taking a, a US market look, uh, a mar yeah, market market look at breakdown of the US markets. Um, you know, what I had touched on earlier was actually just really, really surface level. I kind of want to do a bit more and, and get people a bit more familiar with it because it's definitely one of those markets that you need to you need to be in, I, I think, personally. Um, and the historical performance of it and, and these types of big winners in innovation uh, and what it means for, for future gains as well. Yeah. U.S. markets are always, you know, the largest market around. It's had a great 2020 uh, market volatility is still up in 2021. In fact, I think, you know, we've, we've had a very interesting, I think, two, three weeks uh, with the U.S. markets. Definitely, definitely come join us in April. All yeah. right. Uh, let's just see q and I think we're going to flash out some of the questions that have come in from the audience. Thank you, Kinao. Right. Question number one. Most of the US share prices are at peak and overvalued. What is your opinion on the near term US market correction and direction? Tim. Um, I think this comes back to another, another question about anchoring is, I think this is another psychological lesson. Like when you, we don't want to buy, buy stocks when they're at all time highs. Um, but then they can also keep going higher. I, I can't really comment, and I don't think anyone can comment on the short-term direction of the market. We, we don't know that. We have no idea what will happen in the next six months or 12 months, to be honest. Um, but in terms of the overvaluation, I don't think the valuation levels are anywhere near what they were in 2000. And that was a time when companies in the US tech companies were making literally nothing, no money. Um, whereas nowadays, these, as these tech companies I touched on earlier are making boatloads of money and cash and real, real cash, right, real profits. Um, so I think you just have to be a bit wary of, of the companies you're investing in and making sure they've got the solid fundamentals, you know, really solid balance sheets. Um, and if it does crash and these companies that you think are doing great, uh, you know, they, they fall with, with the market, I think that's an opportunity to pick it up for long term. But I think it's more just focusing on the long term and just understanding that the markets rise over the long term. This has happened over the past hundred years. So even if they, there is a 20, 30% drop, you know, or a 40% drop, you know, that they will rise again over time. Um, but it's that, it's that, uh, it's obviously hard to see that happen, but to be staying invested, I think is the key and to, and to just be consistent. Yeah. I think uh, Ping Mei, you're on mute. Mei, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I was uh, asking Sudan, you know, because Sudan mentioned just now that, you know, in Singapore market, we have, we're seeing a lot of value stocks, which is the opposite of the US markets where a lot of stocks are overvalued or perceived as overvalued if you look at the, you know, the numbers. So what, what's your view on this? Yeah, I think uh, the US uh, steam covered earlier is mainly, uh, especially the S&P 500 index, is mainly made up of tech stocks. So uh, generally during the pandemic, all these tech stocks benefited, even though they fell uh, initially in the March uh, drawdown. But um, people realized that you no know, tech stocks, digitalization is the way to go. Um, even during COVID, uh, e-commerce companies, Amazon was doing very well. People were still ordering from Amazon. Um, companies like uh, Shopee, which is listed on uh, C under the C group, listed in, um, in US, also saw a lot of um, action uh, in terms of uh, business activity. So um, obviously Singapore 
Singapore, the Straits Times Index selects these kind of companies. So um, it's just made up of the banks, the old economy stocks, uh, as some would call it, um, Singtel, Telco, and stuff like that. So, um, so there weren't my, much, um, much, much business to be done for 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 these kind of companies during lockdowns and stuff like that. So, as a result, the Straits Times Index suffered a lot. Um, but I think uh, back to this question, I don't think uh, U.S. share prices are at the peak. Um, not so for certain companies. For example, if if the company has a huge uh, market opportunity, a total addressable market where it can grow into the billions uh, over the long term, I think uh, there's still room for growth for these companies, even though at 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 um, at, at one look it might it may look expensive. But if you go beyond that, the valuation, and if you look over the long term, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I think these companies can continue doing well. Companies like Zoom, companies like uh, Facebook, sub companies like Google, I think, uh, and even DocuSign, people won't just suddenly stop using all these companies' uh, services just because the pandemic is over and so on. So I think over the super long term, uh, I think all these companies still have potential to grow. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think we're now ready for the next question. Okay, so this is still very much uh, related to the US. How much of the market gains were driven by Fed quantitative easing? Any sense on downside given yield curve steepening? Tim? I don't think the, um, I mean, I think it's quite obvious rather, sorry, that, that, that some of the gains were driven by by the Fed, right? I mean, the Fed put basically saying that, you know, th that we'll do whatever it takes, but that was what, in March last year? And then the gains have continued upwards since then. But if you've seen the 10 year treasury in terms of the yield over the past 40 years, it's been falling structurally. So I don't know, I don't, I personally don't think that we're gonna see a, an era where interest rates are at like 10 or 15% or even at five. So. You know, yield curve steepening in the 10 year has spooked the market. 10 years gone up a bit and spooked the market. But you know, that doesn't really that doesn't really stop me from investing in good companies that I like. So if the yield curve is steepening and then 10 years going up, I'm not gonna suddenly think, oh, I want to invest in bad companies that are value plays. Like, oh, I'm gonna invest in value play because that's going to have a good run for six months. That's not really the mentality I think about. It's more about what companies do I like. If it happens to be a value company, that's great. If it doesn't, then th there's no point. I just want to invest in companies that are great companies that are going to continue to grow their businesses over, you know, five, 10, 15 years. I mean, I can't really talk about Jay Powell and what he's going to do in the next year or two, right? So all we can do is speculate on that. But I think just sticking to buying great businesses and making sure that you do that consistently is, is the key, really. Yeah, I think we all wish we, we had a crystal ball and could predict the future. But the reality is, you know, no one can really tell, you know, how things are gonna gonna play out. I mean, as everyone keeps saying, we're in unprecedented times. All right, uh, next question, please. Okay. If you compare banks in Singapore versus the region, even the US, would you still pick Singapore banks? And which bank do you favor? I think this is a good question for Sudan since you talked quite a little bit about the Singapore banks just now. Yeah, so uh, I haven't personally compared Singapore banks against the uh, US banks or other, other banks listed elsewhere. But I, I believe the Singapore banks are, are very well capitalized, are stronger. Um, in fact, compared to the U.S. banks back in 2008, I think the Singapore banks um, did much better than the U.S. counterparts back then. So I think even now, they are still strong banks, strong, strong companies. And I think they will still continue doing well over the longer term, um, especially when um, all these banks have a footing in Asia. And when businesses want to expand in Asia, they, they most probably have to go through uh, all these banks. So I think... Uh, I think these banks have, have got a, a tailwind on their side, you know, as they grow with the region, these banks can grow as well. Uh, which bank I personally favor, um, it also depends. If, if you are going for dividend, dividend kind of uh, uh, potential, potential for dividend increases, I think OCBC is, 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 is the one. 
um, because it's it's dividend payout ratio is much much lesser than what they can um, then compared to the other banks. But if you're going more for growth, I think DBS is it's, it's the bank to go. But in general, all three banks, I think they are they are very well managed and they should do well over the long term. Uh, Tim, any US banks or any other banks in, I don't know, Hong Kong or any other markets that you particularly like? Um, I really like, I really like HDFC Bank in India. It's probably one of the lesser known banks, um, but it's one of those banks that has just consistently performed really well. They have a listing in the US and ADR, so you can buy the listing in the US. Um, but it's one of those smaller, I mean, it's, it's a private bank. Uh, so the Indian market is dominated by a lot of state owned banks, which are very inefficient, but this is extremely well run, very professionally well run, have, has professional management, um, has been you know, performing for the past two decades on a consistent basis, uh, has a very sort of low NPL ratios uh, in terms of its lending. So its lending criteria is very strict. They're very disciplined. Uh, so I think that's, one bank that is maybe a bit unorthodox, I, I really like. US banks, again, same, I'm similar to Sina. I don't know a lot about the US banks. They don't excite me that much because of, I think the, the amount, I mean, just how anemic the growth is in the economy. And I think the, the, the banks are really tied to the economy in terms of how, you know, how well it can perform and how much growth there is in lending. Um, but I just know the US banks are definitely better than the European banks. I mean, the European banks have just been terrible for a decade and I don't see that changing. Uh, just because Europe is so anemic with growth. Um, and I think the problem that they had post 2008 is that they didn't get rid of their, their dud loans on the balance sheet quick enough, whereas the US did with the stress tests. So the US coming out of the recovery was, was a lot better and a lot more disciplined, uh, whereas Europe was just muddling through uh, and it's still, it's still suffering, I think, today. That's a very inter interesting uh, choice, HDFC. Uh... We don't, we don't exactly, uh, you know, cover Indian markets, uh, but I'm glad you did mention that you can actually buy an ADR on the US markets. Uh, I do recognize they're already at 9 p.m., uh, but we do have a couple more questions that I think would be good for us to, to address. So uh, let's just get them up. All right, between REITs and REITs ETFs, are there any downsides to buying REITs ETFs or should I focus on REITs exclusively if the yield is similar to REITs ETFs? I think this is a question for you, Sudan. You're our REITs expert. Yeah, so there are downsides to all investments. So uh, REITs ETF as well. So one thing to look out for for uh, ETFs in general is this thing called tracking error. So uh, ETFs, if they are mimicking the index, they're supposed to move uh, one is to one. But um, due to certain uh, anomalies, they may not always uh, move 100% with the index. So there's this thing called tracking error if, if there are changes uh, between the, the index and the ETF. So uh, that's one thing to look out for um, in terms of uh, ETF. So for downsides in particular, for each of the uh, ETFs, you can look at the prospectus for the ETFs before you actually buy into them. Uh, you can just Google um, the the name of the ETF plus prospectus to, to just um, bring up the document. So yeah, that's what one thing you can do. Um, in terms of question on, should I focus on REITs exclusively? The yields are similar. So it also depends on how, how comfortable you are in buying uh, individual REITs compared to a basket of REITs. So buying a basket of REITs has its uh, advantages, which is one is you, you instantly diversify your portfolio by just buying that ETF compared to buying individual REITs. And buying individual REITs also comes with its own risks, uh, depending on which industry you buy into. So uh, these are some of the things you can look into. So it entirely depends on how comfortable you are with uh, picking individual REITs. Yeah. Thank you for that. Hope it answers uh, the question. Uh, can we have the last question, please? All right. If only a few stocks tend to dominate certain market and indexes, would just buying those few top stocks and winners makes more sense than buying the whole market via an index? Tim, would you like to take this one? Um, yeah, I, 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 think it's, I think it's still different. I mean, even with the top five, as I had mentioned in the US, uh, they made up 
close to 20%, there's still an 80% weighting that's not those tech giants. So that's still a very big weighting. Um, so, I th you know, you've seen over the past couple of weeks, the S&P 500 hit a record high while tech has kind of fallen and, and suffered a little bit, right, in a, a sell-off. Um, so that kind of shows you that there is there are those other companies that are starting to, to, to make a comeback this year on the back of, you know, the reopening in the US and globally. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily just picking those top stock winners, but if you do buy those top stocks, maybe you can just buy a couple of them um, and, then, and then figure out if you wanna be in more select ETFs. But I think it's always good to have broad market exposure. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, and I don't think these top stocks are ever gonna make up say 30 or 40% of an index. Uh, you know, a broad index. So that would be my, uh, that would be my take. What about you, uh, Sudan? Would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, I would actually echo what uh, Tim said. So um, the big big names take up 20% of the index, but the the rest of the 80% is, is taken up by many other companies. So um, it's back to diversification, uh, whether you want to uh, buy one ETF and diversify your portfolio versus picking the few stocks. And if you pick the top few stocks, uh, if there's a if there's a sell off, um, the stocks can suffer in the short term. Yeah, but if you have belief in the long term of 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 the companies, I think uh, you can even actually buy more of those uh, stocks during the sell off. Um, yeah, so that's my take. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sudan and Tim. I think we are finish with the Q&A session for tonight. I think uh, the last bit we have right now is a survey for all the attendees. We will also be giving away a free ticket to the Sydney Finance Festival event uh, for all the attendees who kindly complete this survey. So I'm just going to quickly read out the instructions. For those on Zoom, the survey will pop up after exiting from today's session. For those on Facebook, please scan the QR code on the slide as shown or type in this link for the survey. So once again, thank you very much, Tim and Sudan, for today's Bye. session. And a very big thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. We hope that you have had an educational session with us. And uh, please join us for the next webinar in April. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.